So our next speaker is Amanda Bland. Before joining the MAS NBC cohort, Amanda worked for a law firm in Washington, DC, managing climate resiliency projects in Maryland, and collected data on whale sharks in Bahia, Mexico. As a Chesapeake Bay native, she entered the program with a strong passion for sustainable fisheries. And while she was here, she developed that passion by working with NOAA, scientists at NOAA, and looking at trends in fisheries on uh, sardines and anchovy right here in Southern California. Amanda was awarded the Jameson Newton Scholarship and will be traveling to American Samoa this summer to work on a coral reef restoration project focusing on the positive impacts of giant tritons on coral reefs. The name of her project today is In a Pinch, utilizing the Caribbean king crab as a blue economy model in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Welcome, Amanda. If I were to ask you what species comes to mind when you think of a grazer, you would probably say a cow or maybe a goat. But what if I told you that the species I would be talking about today um, has six legs and two claws? The Caribbean king crab is a grazer that consumes a diet almost entirely made up of algae. And the small juvenile crabs eat just as much algae as the large crabs. And we will discuss why this is so valuable later on in the presentation. The Caribbean king crab is an ideal grazer on coral reefs as algae overgrowth on coral reefs leads to coral reef decline. The Caribbean king crab serves as the ideal coral reef restoration tool. As alluded to in its name, the Caribbean king crab is native to the Caribbean and the Florida Keys. The southernmost tip of Florida is made up of the Florida Keys, and it has the only coral, coral barrier reef in the United States, and it also happens to be a national marine sanctuary. This reef spans the sanctuary from northern Key Largo down to southern Key West, and it supports species like sharks, sea turtles, rays, and hundreds of fish species. The Keys are a hub for tourism. People visit from all over the world to snorkel and dive and sport fish, and these activities, amongst so many others, rely on a healthy coral reef ecosystem. One out of every two jobs in the Keys is connected back to this vital marine environment. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, in partnership with the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation and Moat Marine Labs, is leading an initiative known as Mission Iconic Reef. And this uh, project aims to restore seven of the iconic reefs in the Florida Keys. Millions of dollars are being funneled into this work. It also happens to be one of the largest coral reef restoration projects in the world. Over the last 40 years, human-induced stressors have compounded to reduce coral cover on coral reefs. In the 1980s, there was roughly 25% coral cover on these reefs in the Keys. In 2019, this number had decreased down to 5%. At Cary's Fort Reef, pictured above, which is one of these iconic seven, you can see how coral cover has drastically decreased from 1975 to 2014. And again, one of the leading causes of this decline in coral is due to algae overgrowth. There have been numerous pilot projects to help determine the positive benefits that these crabs can have on coral reefs, and one of these projects took place in Mexico. It found that just introducing 24 crabs could reduce algae from 34% down to 25% cover, and in turn, coral cover increased from 3% up to 13%. The Caribbean king crab serves as a mechanism to help us achieve mission iconic reefs. The Caribbean king crab can decrease algae cover, increase coral cover, and this will benefit the Keys environment, community, and the local economy. So we know that this crab is native, it eats algae, and it improves coral reef health. If we were to create a Caribbean king crab fishery in the Keys, can it also be lucrative and sustainable? For my capstone project, I conducted a market analysis of the species, the Caribbean king crab, to determine if in fact it can be a lucrative species in the Florida Keys, along with its purpose of serving as a coral reef restoration tool. 
So you may be asking yourself, because I know that I was when I embarked on this project, why would we eat the crab if its primary purpose is to eat algae and coral reefs? So let's walk through a potential business model together. In order to meet our coral reef restoration goals, we need to drastically increase the number of crabs on these reefs. These crabs can be grown in labs, transported via trucks and boats out onto the coral reefs, where the small juvenile crabs that eat as much algae as the big ones can get to work munching away on the algae. And once they reach these large sizes, we can harvest them and sell them as a high priced seafood commodity in the Keys generating revenue. And this size component, or I guess algae consumption component, of the small ones eat as much as the large ones is so important because as long as these crabs are on the reefs, they're doing their job. In April, I had the opportunity to travel to the Keys and drive it in its entirety with my capstone advisory committee. One hour after landing at the Miami airport, we were already down at Moats Marine Lab in Key Largo, where both coral and the Caribbean king crab are being grown. And the next day, we made it down to the coral nursery in Key West. It was here where we met with project partners to ex who were experts in mariculture, Caribbean king crab biology, and coral reef restoration experts. We met to work together, collaborate, and workshop to discuss what a potential Caribbean king crab fishery might look like. And when I returned from the Keys was when my real work began. I conducted my market analysis in three phases. So for phase one, I conducted a literature review of roughly 50 sources. And this literature review ranged from sources of NOAA fishery reports, Florida aquaculture plans, and Florida seafood reports. During phase two, I conducted a SIPOC analysis. SIPOC stands for supplier, inputs, product, outputs, and customers. So for example, take the stone crab, which is a native and lucrative species in the Florida Keys. I explored the suppliers, inputs, product, outputs, and customers for this species. And then I went ahead and did this exact same analysis for five other lucrative native species in the Florida Keys. I did this because existing fisheries can form opportunities for a potential Caribbean king crab fishery. So for example, if we know, say, the market price for stone crab, this can help inform what the market price might be for the Caribbean king crab. My literature review, SIPOC, and discussions for my time in the Keys all informed my market analysis. I identified 12 subject areas, including growth opportunities, market demographics, industry trends, competitive landscapes, and market barriers. And my market analysis highlights information such as how might a Caribbean king crab fishery compare with current seafood trends? Um, how might this fishery meet current seafood demands? How can it meet state aquaculture goals? And what about this particular species of crab makes it the ideal species to cultivate? This document is not complete as one of these subject areas alone could take months of research to build out. Uh, but it's a resource and more than that, it's a model that will continue to be developed by the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation as well as NOAA to inform a successful Caribbean king crab fishery. And it was this idea that this project could serve as a model that could be applied to other coastal regions that really drew me in in the first place. I grew up in Maryland on the Chesapeake Bay, and I have been intrinsically connected to native fisheries from a very young age. Um, as a very little girl, I would go fishing with my brothers all the time. Um, in college, I worked on a fishing charter boat as a mate. Prior to coming to this program, I worked for an environmental nonprofit where I managed projects that helped to uh, improve water quality and create habitat for vital fisheries. And when I'm home on the East Coast visiting my family, our favorite way to spend time together is out in the water. I have seen native oysters and blue crab populations decline, and I've watched my community struggle economically because of this. The Chesapeake Bay and Florida Keys both rely on healthy marine habitat and their natural resources. 
I wanted to create a tool that could be utilized in the Keys and hopefully other regions to help find innovative solutions to our global challenges. My hope is that coastal regions can continue to be a place where ecosystems thrive, where people are also able to engage and connect with these special places as well. The Caribbean king crab fishery and the Keys can in fact aid in achieving these goals, can help us restore the coral reefs, contribute to the Keys economy in doing so, and create a lucrative species, creating jobs for the community there. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to my capstone advisory committee um, for their constant input and feedback and support throughout this entire process. Um, my chair, Megan Frazier, along with the rest of my committee, uh, Dr. Jason Spadaro, Matt Warheim, and Dr. Dale Squires. I would also like to extend a huge thank you to my cohort for all of the support and community that you guys have provided this year. And lastly, uh, a huge thank you to my family uh, for being here all the way from the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hey, Amanda. Hi. How are you? I am no scientist, as you know, but I'm always leery when man says, okay, I've got a solution that nature hasn't introduced on its own. Um, and so my first question is, if this has the potential to be a symbiotic relationship, why hasn't nature already sort of solved for this? And my thinking is when we propose solutions like this, it's to um, sort of discover or because we believe what can go right. But how do we anticipate what can go wrong? Mm. Those are really great questions. And you just said you're not a scientist, but I kind of think you have the brain for it. <laughs> um, OK, first question. Uh, why has nature sort of not like redirected us, right? I think, unfortunately, we've uh, disrupted nature, right, with a lot of our impacts. And so it's not able to recover in the way that it really should be able to naturally. Um, and so I think what I really love about this project is it's utilizing a native species to the Keys, a, a species that already exists. Um, and it's, it's, it's using it to help kind of solve this problem we're having. And, um, you know, there's so many ways and in, in this you know project mission iconic reef um, is a massive project and so it's kind of being tackled from a lot of these different um, angles but um, you know there's ways to essentially have humans be more involved in this removal of algae process and if we were to do that it would be incredibly uh, cost inefficient very very expensive and so I think that utilizing this crab um, you know, provides the opportunity to kind of aid in restoration and doing so in a way that also benefit the community economically in starting this new fishery. So I think this kind of two level aspect is um, really smart. And I think that solutions like this, um, we're gonna be seeing them more and more hopefully. I'm so sorry, remind me your second question again. Just how, so we, we introduce these things right. with the hope that they, or with the concept that they're gonna go right. How do we mm. Right. Um, research. So again, this is a massive project. I am working on it and it's infancy. Um, there will be so much more time and energy and research and, and money funneled into this to ensure that it's not going to have, you know, drastic impacts on the environment. Um, but again, because this crab is a native species, um, it really has the potential to have massive positive impacts on the coral reefs there. Thanks, Amanda. I just have a quick question. Um, how can your market analysis of the Caribbean king crab be applied elsewhere to achieve conservation goals? So the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation um, aims to increase blue economies throughout its national marine sanctuaries. And so this project serves as 
sort of the first one and the pilot project in introducing this massive new initiative. Um, and so I think when we're thinking, you know, through um, these projects and what they might look like in other regions, it's about finding the gaps. And so I think it's, it's essential to speak and work with the local community, um, you know, funnel research into it and find out where these needs are specifically and how we can meet them and using models like this of kind of walking through the, the entire process. Okay. Yeah, it's a two part question. The first part is how long does it take a king crab to mature that before you'd want to harvest it? And the second, what would you do to keep from overfishing the king crab? That's a really good question. Um, I, I actually can't recall off my head the like, because there's the larval phase and then there's the to adulthood. I want to say it's really quick. It's about, I think, one to three months. So it's a super short time frame. Um, the model that I discussed is just one potential model. So there's so many ways in which this fishery might look like. Um, but as far as over harvesting, regulation will have a huge um, component in that, ensuring, you know, ensuring that there's laws and policies and regulation in place to make sure that they're not over harvested and that they're able to achieve, you know, the conservation goals before that they are harvested on the reefs. So still a lot of, a lot of thought that needs to be put into the project to ensure that it's met by all angles. Thanks so much, Amanda. Thank you.